Awesome. Well, it, it's three o'clock here in the central time. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's Innovare Back to School Playbook Webinar Series session. Uh, again, we're super excited to be here with you all again this week uh, to be providing you some uh, expertise around, you know, how are we successfully transitioning back in and through this remote environment uh, in, in our education space. Um, so again, just my a quick introduction on myself. My name is Nick Freeman. I'm the co-founder and president with Innovare Social Innovation Partners, uh, where our all-in-one data strategy and project management application, Inno, and then our community of change makers, um, which we consider our Innoverse, really empowers education leaders and NGO leaders really to impact the schools and communities that they're supporting. Uh, just to give you a little bit more context on what our look our work looks like. Um, today, you're here engaging with us in that Innoverse. So again, that's where we're bringing, you know, uh, content area experts to the table uh, to really present and, and provide us with their expertise around how can we be effectively supporting our communities, whether it be around ensuring that equity is in existence, uh, ensuring that the social emotional needs that our students are being met, or that we're using the remote env environment and, and the technology that we have to best provide for our communities. Um, and I also, as I mentioned, uh, our application Inno, which is that all-in-one data strategy and project management application, where our leaders are able to come together, to grow together, and really to truly have that impact of our work. Um, so again, today we're here on Facebook Live, we're on our uh, the Zoom webinar as well. So feel free to utilize the chat functionality uh, to really engage with any questions or comments that you might have. Uh, but without further ado, we're super excited for today uh, with Colin Seal from ThinkLaw, the co-founder, I'm sorry, the founder and CEO of Think Law is here today to really speak towards us on, you know, closing the, um, you know, closing the equity gap. So how do we ensure that equity has a case for making rigorous learning accessible to all of our students? So again, we're super excited for Colin to be here with us today. Um, and without further ado, Colin, I'd love to kick it over to you. All right, all right. Um, so I am really excited to be here with you all to be part of this conversation. Um, and we are gonna kick it right off. So this idea of closing a critical thinking gap is something that stems out of the work that I lead with Think Law. I found the Think Law five years ago to really try to make educational equity actionable at the classroom level. We do this using real life legal cases in upper grades, fairy tales and nursery rhymes in lower grades because there's a whole lot of shady characters in children's stories. Don't even let me get started on Goldilocks and her trifling behind. But as we go further in thinking through this, um, there's a couple of things that I want to just share as we kick this off. So if you're someone who likes to follow along with the conversation on social media, you can follow me at Twitter at Colin E. Seal, or you can follow the work that Think Law does on Twitter or Instagram at Think Law US. Also, for anyone that's looking to get a handout that could kind of walk you through some of the key things I talk about today, as well as get a chance to view one of the sample lessons that we talk about, um, if you text the word THINK to 66866, you'll be able to enter in your email and be part of a list that will send that all to you going forward. Last but not least, this is a really short sort of overview of an approach that you can do. We go into this approach a lot more in my book, Thinking Like a Lawyer, which you can check out on Amazon or you can also get a chance to buy it in bulk if you're looking to get it for your school system by visiting the Think Law website at thinklaw.us. Uh, think so as I kick off this conversation, I want to kick it off with a conversation that we heard a lot around this summer. For those of you that, that pay a lot of attention to what goes on in the public charter school sector, um, Kick Public Schools kind of made a lot of education headlines because their motto, work hard, be nice, is something that they decided to phase out. And I've really understood a lot about the Kick Network since I started teaching in 2004. And this work hard, be nice wasn't just a mantra of Kip. In fact, this became a lot of the kind of set of uh, mindsets that really were able to inform the teaching strategies for a lot of educators. But as we met this moment of reckoning around racial justice, there's a lot of pressure from the Kip students, Kip alumni to change this model. And I wanna kind of pose this question to you all that are here. And I wanna actually ask you to drop it in the chat real quick. From the perspective of thinking about this motto, work hard, be nice. If we were playing the game of Family Feud, what do you think the number one reason would be that this idea of work hard, be nice doesn't quite fit? What's missing? What's wrong with work hard, be nice as a model for a school system 
that prides itself in serving really large numbers of black and brown children in particular who are living in poverty. What's wrong with work hard, be nice? And as I've gone around the country asking these questions, a lot of times I get comment responses. I get responses like, well, I thought it's supposed to be work smart, not work hard. Well, what does be nice actually mean? Does be nice mean be complacent? Does be nice mean we kind of accept things as they are? Does work hard really capture the essence of what's going on? Because if we've created a system where some people kind of always have to work twice as hard just to get half as far, and other people can work much less because of other ways that they're able to get privileges and different starting points in life. Is that even really fair? So when we start looking at this set of questions collectively, work hard, be nice, is open to skepticism. And as I go even further with this, I want to actually name something that a lot of people might not be as familiar with. What does KIPP actually stand for? Well, the acronym for KIPP came from the Knowledge is Power program. This network of schools all across the country started with a smaller program called the Knowledge is Power program. And I don't know about you, but I grew up with the mantra of knowledge is power. But one of the most interesting parts of uh, Dr. Kennedy's How to Be an Anti-Racist is where he clarifies that this isn't necessarily true. In fact, knowledge is only power if you're using that knowledge and applying that knowledge towards the struggle for power. So when I think about this, when I think about this moment that we've reached around March or so, when we started to realize the impact of COVID, we started to recognize that schools as we knew them wouldn't be able to operate across the country. For a lot of people, this was the moment where they first realized that racial inequities existed. And to go a little bit deeper, a lot of what people spoke about was access and connectivity. Access and connectivity. And I get it. It's really hard to talk about education at all if we don't have people who can connect to education in a distance learning environment because they're lacking a working device or they're lacking Wi-Fi. But if we're being honest about questions around equity and access, a lot of our kids have been disconnected to meaningful educational opportunity for some time. A lot of kids have lacked access to transformational educational experience for a long time. So really, issues of access and connectivity stem far beyond a working device in a hotspot and go back way further than COVID-19. And what's so interesting about this, as we've gotten more and more into this moment of understanding that we've got a pandemic of racial injustice as well in our society, we get to a point where we start to have these questions around things like systemic racism. And I think there's a whole lot of folks that when they hear racism, they think about the Ku Klux Klan. They think about those folks in Charlottesville that were walking around with their tiki torches screaming blood and soil. I recommend for anyone that really wants to dive deeply into the idea of systemic racism, to read a piece by Nicole Hannah Jones that she wrote for the New York Times where she makes the case for reparations. But without even going that deep, let me sort of just kind of take this to a different level because you know what? Innovare is an organization that is based in Chicago. So let's take this conversation to Chicago real quick. And before I take it there, I want to kind of give you the premise for why I'm talking about this. Systemic racism plays a role in what we see right here in front of us. We've had conversations, I'm sure this is not the first time if you've heard of the term, the wealth gap. But it has really puzzled a lot of policy analysts, a lot of policy folks around like, why is it like the gap is increasing or at least not decreasing? What is going on? And this is a chart that looks at this gap from 1983 to 2010. But if we're really thinking about this, we might want to go a little bit earlier. Like go a little bit earlier. Maybe some of you are nodding your head because you might know where I'm going with this. But let's just kind of take a step back for a second. Let's go to Chicago. Let's go to the Inglewood community of Chicago. Let's look at this zip code, 60621. I just wanna focus in on this area for a second so we can get an understanding of what it means when we talk about systemic racism. So when I look at this zip code, 
I don't want to talk from a deficit lens necessarily because I know that we've got so many people in this community that are resilient, that are resourceful, that are critical thinkers who think on their toes, who've been able to figure out the magical calculus, who've been able to have this superhuman power to make a dollar out of 15 cents. But I want to make it clear they've never been doing this out of a sense of genetic superiority or because they really, really wanted to. They've had to be these phenomenal human beings because they've had no other choice. So I can paint the picture of this neighborhood and give you all the stats around poverty rates, around how the schools are looking, around the crime rates. We can go even deeper. We can start looking at the COVID-19 rates. And a lot of times I don't just look in that, look, like looking at the raw numbers. I like looking at the death rates. One of the truest measures of inequality is what are the death rates? Because that shows you what that means around healthcare, what that means about pre-existing conditions, healthy food options. We start playing it out. And I start realizing maybe I got to go back a little bit further. If I go back a little bit further and I look at the same exact neighborhood. There's this website called Mapping Inequality that goes back to this era after the Great Depression where the banks decided we can't just give out loans willy-nilly anymore. But what they decided to do was make it so that one of the key criteria, one of the key factors that would prevent you from being able to get a loan in your neighborhood. And mind you, when it comes to that wealth gap, one of the most common pathways to wealth in the United States to this day is home ownership. But if by chance you happen to have a certain set of criteria to be true in this neighborhood, there was no chance of you being able to get a loan. So when I look at this same section of the city, what were the disqualification factors here? Well, it turns out this was a time where counting the number of colored people in your community was a part of understanding whether or not your neighborhood was gonna be all right to loan anything with, okay? There's colored people, two blacks to them, oh, there they go over there, they're over there. We start looking at this idea, of, oh, there are about a dozen colored families. They actually counted it. They looked to this to determine that these people right here will be derated and not be able to get access to government-backed loans, which means inevitably they didn't have access to home ownership, period. So we start looking around that area and we realize, okay, so that's just that local space. But if you dig deeper into the analysis, they didn't just have that paragraph. They also have these categories. Is there infiltration? Yep, Negroes. Are there foreigners? And here's what's so crazy. We're taught this myth, the American melting pot. But like not everybody melts into that pot equally. So even foreigners in your community was able to, to, to make it so that you weren't able to, to, to get loans there. We start looking at mixed Irish, Italian. That was a funk too. Low class Jews coming from the North. Mm -mm, we're not having that either. And what I want to point out here are a couple things. Do you remember last year? in 2019, in August 2019, when that young man from the Dallas-Fort Worth area decided to drive all the way down to the border in El Paso and massacre people at the Walmart for no other reason but their nationality? Didn't he use the word infiltration? Wasn't that part of the manifesto, infiltration? And we start looking at this and understanding that this is not just a Chicago issue. What made this so interesting is we talk about this, well, they could have just worked harder, right? Work hard, be nice. Work hard and be nice wasn't a path to economic success. And sticking with Chicago, a lot of people probably have heard of A Raisin in the Sun. It's a very popular play that kids learn in school, particularly a play by a black playwright. But a lot of people don't know that Lorraine Hansberry's family is the subject of a case that every single law student does when they're in law school. A Raisin in the Sun was about a family trying to come up and the neighborhood didn't want them, right? But it wasn't some random story. This was her life. This was her life. When her family tried to come up, it turned out that if you had that infiltration, there goes to the neighborhood. You think that phrase is a coincidence? There goes to the neighborhood. They had this thing called restrictive covenants. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Restrictive covenants are very common in homeowners associations like the community that I live in. And sometimes it makes sense. I can't paint my house zebra, okay? And that's probably a good idea because if I can't do it, then my neighbor can't do it, then that other neighbor down the street also can't paint that house zebra. Helps protect their housing values. 
But during this time, what Lorraine Hansberry's family was challenging along with the NAACP was the restrictive covenants that didn't allow you to transfer your property to black folks, to Mexicans, to Chinese people. Like if you had those covenants that required your neighborhood to be white because nobody wanted to see their value go down. Now you've created this sort of trap to go even further, we talk about the trap. Like even in more current days, we start looking at lending patterns and you see the same built in muscle memory of we're not investing in these communities. For every $1 in a white area, 12 cents are coming in the black areas like Inglewood. The same community we're talking about. And what is the kicker? What is the absolute insult to the injury? These are the same neighborhoods today where massive gentrification is happening. So you talk about people who have lacked access for generations because they were denied wealth. And now those who were granted wealth in other places, and I say granted because when the federal government backs 90% of your loan, it's essentially being granted wealth. And now they can't afford to live in the same neighborhood they were forced to be in for generations. So we start realizing this is a broader issue. We see this in Phoenix, Arizona, where we got this infiltration of Mexicans and Negroes. We see this in places like Spokane, Washington, where again, that whole melting pot question becomes very suspect. 20% Southern European got that to have a red light. Kansas City, Dallas, Denver. And I wanna talk about Denver for a second, okay? Because this particular section in Denver really tells you that work hard, be nice is not anywhere close to the kind of model our kids need. If you look at this particular neighborhood, what does it say here? This was called the Negro Country Club. They actually said this is one of the best colored areas in the whole United States of America. And you know there's those parts of those things where you're like, I can't believe you're saying the quiet part out loud. In the official documentation, they're actually saying word for word, were it not for the heavy colored population, much of it would be eligible for loans. But damn those black people. So when we start looking at these things, we've got to stop saying things like the system is broken. The system is actually designed to be built this way. And if we have a system that's designed to be built this way, we cannot model an educational formula around work hard to be nice. It's not going to cut it. Knowledge is only power if it's put towards the struggle for power. But what if Putting knowledge towards the struggle for power was also a very important instructional construct to give our kids access to critical thinking. Let's talk about this. In today's workshop, I'm gonna break down critical thinking, make sure you understand why critical thinking is so challenging to teach. I'm gonna give you a lot of interactions around critical thinking so you understand the nuances of it. And I wanna make sure that you see how it applies to, to actual curricular content. This is my family. We live in Phoenix, Arizona, because my wife is a professor at Arizona State. I got these two kids, Rose and Oliver. Oliver is five, Rose is seven years old. I like to kind of paint this picture of this family because it always strikes me that we've been able to build and I've been able to be in a space where I could be a math teacher, after being a computer science graduate, and end up being in a space where after being a lawyer that graduated top of my class, I built this organization that works with schools in 35 states. And all of that is possible, even though I was the kid that a lot of us struggle to serve today. I was the kid who was on free and reduced lunch. I was the kid who was born in a single parent, raised in a single parent family, first generation in this country, because my family's all from Barbados. I was the kid who's getting in a lot of trouble. It's getting in a lot of trouble. It's very mouthy, very, very mouthy. I, I had a, a, a science lab lady. Her name was Miss Lipschitz. Honestly, how could you not get in trouble with somebody's name is Lipschitz? It's not even really my fault. And Miss Lipschitz once asked me to write a 100 word reflection on my behavior. So I sat and I thought about it. I did the math in my head and I decided to write, I hate science exactly 32 times because that way I had words left over to say, I hate you too. Exactly four words, I hate you too. That was me in first grade. And what's important about that is that there was a power professional who noticed me and decided you need to get this kid tested. And my mom got me tested and I ended up being in this gifted and talented program. And I wanna talk about this gifted and talented program because this was transformational. 
When I say it's transformational in this class, the same behavior that I used to get in trouble for was now required. Now I was supposed to question my teacher and it wasn't considered willful defiance. It was me being inquisitive and curious. Now I was supposed to get out of my seat and interact with my peers. And it wasn't me acting the fool. It was me exemplifying 21st century collaboration. But there's something else that's funky about this experience. At PS208 in Brooklyn, New York, the average elementary school class had 30 plus kids. Mine only had 24, but if you look even closer, that says fourth slash fifth grade. My whole time in this program, they only identified 12 kids per grade level that were being bused to this school for this transformational experience. So at a really early age, I understood that although brilliance is distributed equally, so often opportunity is not. And when I talk about that opportunity, I'm talking about the same thing that made me want to be a teacher. And when I became a teacher, for me, equitable opportunity meant we needed to make sure our kids were prepared. Because I could look at these numbers and say, you know what? When I look at eighth grade test scores, this is trash. This means that we're sending the majority of kids to high school without saying that they're ready for what high school is going to entail. This is not good, especially because, you know, when we start digging deep, you know, whether you call it an achievement gap or an opportunity gap, certain groups of kids are being hurt more by these issues around performance. So this was the hill that I stood on, hardcore. Like, we got to look at the outcomes as the equity, hardcore. And I still believe this to a certain extent. But on the other hand, I've got to ask myself, my mom immigrated from Barbados to the United States in the 70s. And she was brought up under a framework where you got to work twice as hard to get half as far. And then decides to bring me up under the same framework. Hey, Colin, you've got to work twice as hard to get half as far. What if I don't want to tell that to my daughter? What if at a certain point, we've got to question the system altogether? And I think the moment that we ended up with, when it came to this reckoning around racial justice and education and the society as a whole, led me to feel like we've got to have a racial justice plan. If you follow my blog for Forbes, you would see like that's a big part of what I'm talking about. Like we've got to have a racial justice plan, except there's something about this that doesn't quite resonate either. Like, I don't know what it means to send a group of teachers to an implicit bias training, when in reality, so many of the issues we see today are actually explicit bias. Like, no one's really all that concerned with your subconscious ridiculousness. I'm really concerned with the fact that you tell boys like me that I need to be isolated in a special education class because I'm too extra. When the same exact conduct and a different kind of class will get me in your gifted and talented program if I had a different skin color, okay? That's not implicit, that's explicit. I also worry about this because I think sometimes we settle for things and we say we did it. Oh, we did the book study on white fragility. We did the book study on how to be an anti-racist, so we're good. Look, we got more diverse books, but if you're still teaching those books in a way where the teacher has all the power, it's not enough. And what really got me thinking about this was a very interesting experience. In high school in New York City, I went to the Bronx High School of Science. For those of you that are familiar, a lot of other cities have a school like this too, where the sole criteria for getting in is a test. It was a tested school. And it was a school for high achievers. It was a school that was modeled around the concept of harder, faster, more. I think y'all know what I'm talking about, right? It was harder, faster, more. It was an interesting school demographically. About 50% of our school population were Asians. We had a lot of first gen kids like me. We had a lot of kids who were actually immigrants. We had a pretty significant free and reduced lunch number at our school. Deerfield Academy, on the other hand, only a handful of kids there were on scholarship. One of my best friends was actually there. And I went to go visit him once, Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts. And I remember having my little blazer on. And it turned out we were both reading the Scarlet Letter at the same times. But it was like a tale of two schools. You know how a tale of two cities started with it's the best of times, it was the worst of times? It was a completely different way to look at how knowledge was gained. At Bronx Science, we did a Scarlet Letter like we did any other book. 
She sat there with the objectives on the board, walked us through what we needed to learn, went through the objectives, and we walked out of there with exactly what we needed to learn. In other words, we weren't being taught how to think. We were being taught what to think. Deerfield Academy was so different. Walk in, there's nothing on the board. There is no board. I don't even know where the teacher is. Where's your teacher? Oh, we're sitting around at the round table. Well, this is so weird. What am I supposed to like do? Like, what's, there's nothing to do now. Well, we just start talking. You just talked about the reading? Yeah, we just have a conversation. And he poses these Socratic style questions and I'm in this classroom. As a kid who was underachieving, as a kid who was struggling at Bronx Science, all of a sudden, I'm on fire. All of a sudden, I'm making connections between the Scarlet Letter and the Salem Witch Trials and the Communist Red Scare hearings with Joe McCarty. And I'm just like, man, this is blowing my mind. Blowing my mind. But who went to Deerfield Academy? I'll tell you who went there. The children of Fortune 500 leaders. The children of US senators. And you know what they were learning there? They were learning how to lead, innovate, and break the things that need to be broken. And at Bronx Science, I was learning how to get a good job with those people. This is when I started to really recognize that critical thinking can't be a luxury good. If we can create a system that makes it possible that kids in Inglewood, in Brooklyn, in Phoenix, in Dallas, in all the places where systems need to be broken to do just that. If all kids actually had a true opportunity to lead, innovate, and break the things that need to be broken, because that's what they were taught in school, now we're talking about a clear pathway to racial justice that goes beyond buzzwords and trainings that don't transfer into the classroom experience. So we call this the educational equity equation. This is a big part of what we look at here. And, and we know that critical thinking is so crucial. We know how much it matters. But I want to pose another question to you all. If it's true that we need critical thinkers more than any time in, in, in human history, if it's true that COVID-19 has revealed that we have a massive systemic gap when it comes to critical thinkers, why do we still treat it like a luxury bed? Why? Why aren't we teaching critical thinking to every single child? What's happening? Why are we reserving it for the most elite kids? at the most elite schools, what's going on? Why are we doing this? You can drop your thoughts in the chat. But as you're thinking about this, I wanna kind of share what I found in the last five years speaking to thousands and thousands of educators. So often this is a challenge around can't, don't, and won't. Can't, don't, and won't. These kids can't think critically. They don't think critically. And if I went through all this work to try to get them to do it, they won't do it. So when I start realizing the gap, the gap here comes down to the how very often. How do I actually make this happen? We can talk about critical thinking all day, but if I can't actually even define it, I certainly can't get to a point where I have a how. So let's spend some time talking about the definition. Many times when I ask what is critical thinking, I always get a very similar answer. Oh, it's being able to think outside the box. It's being able to analyze. It's being able to look at things in different perspectives. And that's all good, except those are only critical thinking skills. Critical thinking skills are important, but they're not it. It's not it. Quick sidebar, this kid Ramel was the sharpest young man I'd ever met. Super creative thinker, brilliant problem solver. But he wasn't a student in my classroom. Ramel was my client in my law school's juvenile justice clinic. And his problem was trying to figure out how to beat adult charges after his arrest on the drug bust one month before his 18th birthday. Ramel had all the critical thinking skills in the world, but you need more than just the skills. You, you need the, the habits and the mindsets to apply those skills. Because we know so many of the kids we serve exemplify critical thinking every day just to survive. But are we being intentional about building out those mindsets? How likely is it that they're applying their critical thinking throughout life, academics, and career? And I think you all know what I'm talking about. You all know at least one person who's unquestionably brilliant, but finds a way to do the dumbest stuff you ever heard of. 
If you act like you don't know that person, you might actually be that person. The difference between knowing better and doing better is often explained by having the skills, the lack in the dispositions. To go even further, it tends to be very context dependent. Thinking like a historian is not necessarily the same as thinking as a scientist, is not the same as thinking like a business person, and is not the same as thinking like a politician. So how do we apply critical thinking across context since our world requires this? And you know what? I used to stop here. I used to say this was my entire framework, but then I realized we've got to push deeper than this. We've got to go beyond this because it turns out critical thinking for the sake of critical thinking isn't going to get us anywhere. There were critical thinkers behind the Holocaust. It didn't really get us anywhere. We've got to figure out not just this framework around critical thinking. We got to address the crisis that we have where why are we so anti-intellectual right now? Like, why is our society experiencing this peak of anti-intellectualism? I've got an idea. Maybe part of it is because so many of our intellectuals are absolute jerks. It's not enough to be smart. I gotta make other people feel stupid. My daughter Rose, one time I'm doing dishes and I'm like, hey Rose, can you pass me the cup? I gotta put it in the dishwasher. Dad, I don't see a cup. You, you're at the table, you see the cup. Can I see, please get the cup. Dad, I don't see a cup. I see a glass though. I turn that sink off so fast. I get it. I think someone, listen, you are not about to be one of those kids who knows exactly what I'm talking about. You find some minor technicality and you use it against me to make me feel stupid. Because you do that, you're not going to have any friends. And I'm saying this to her and I'm realizing this is kind of dramatic, but I'm also asking myself, at what point do we address the reality that we spend so much time in K-12 education around being right, that we don't actually talk about the importance of doing right? and making it clear that doing right is more important than being right. We're so quick to praise people like the late great John Lewis, whose mantra around good trouble is embedded in this framework of doing right being more important than being right. We're so quick to exalt the argument in a letter from a Birmingham jail from Dr. King, which again is going to this idea that doing right is more important than being right, but yet, we usually bring education towards a much more compliant version of our kids learning rather than something that's more divergent, something that allows them to understand that there's a bigger picture. So let's dig into this. Let's actually talk about this idea that maybe equity isn't your thing around racial justice, but maybe you're more looking at the economic aspect of that. Great, because there's equity issues there as well. Because if one group of people is learning by rote memorization and spoon-fed learning, and another group of people are learning how to learn, how to unlearn and how to relearn. If they're learning the kinds of flexible, agile skills they need to succeed in our rapidly changing workforce, well, that's not equitable either. So when we break this down, I don't look at this from a random pie in the sky construct. I don't look at this as this idea that yeah, I know that all these 21st century collaboration and communication and creativity and critical thinking matter. I also know that we're being evaluated by metrics that don't necessarily line up with that. But it's not either or. Part of the educational equity equation is recognizing that both things have to be true. We've got to be able to make sure our kids get academic success. And they also are able to push the conversation around racial justice. In other words, they're not just going to navigate a system that forces them to work twice as hard to get half as far. They're gonna learn how to question the system, how to dismantle the system, and how to build another one as part of core content. This is the conversation I'm having with Dr. Padilla, who's an amazing superintendent out of Newburgh, New York. Um, tomorrow, if you wanna sign up for it, you can sign up on the Think Law website to learn more about this idea of going beyond that these kids can't culture that harms so many of us in education. So I made an interesting life decision. While I was teaching, I decided to go to law school at night. Please don't do that to yourself, right? Not the best life decision, but something interesting happened in law school. First of all, it kind of blew my mind because although it was called law school, you weren't there to learn the law. You were there to learn how to think like a lawyer. To go even deeper, thinking like a lawyer was an interesting approach because for anyone who knows lawyers, you know, they never know how to answer a question. They always like, oh, on one hand, but then again, have you considered? And it's like, why is that? Why is that? Why is it that 
25 past presidents and 35 founding fathers and Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela have all been attorneys. Maybe because when you're thinking like a lawyer, you're hardwired to look at problems and solutions from multiple angles. It's second nature to ask questions to, until you get the information that you need. It's almost instinctual to make a variety of claims and find a way to back up those claims with valid and relevant evidence. And the more I started saying that out loud, the more I started thinking, huh, not only are these a really common set of critical thinking skills in terms of a framework, but if we can tap into our kids' sense of fairness and justice or unfairness and injustice, if we're talking about middle school kids, what a powerful way to make that same argument around the critical thinking gap true. What a powerful way to give our kids the skills to lead, innovate, and break the things that need to be broken. So let me give you a quick example of this, all right? I'm sitting in a class with a professor who's making 200K a year, and we're spending three hours on his case that's written at a third grade level. Here's how this case goes. You got a five-year-old boy named Brian, and this boy sees his aunt about to sit down in the chair. Just before she sits, he pulls it, she falls, breaks her hip, has $11,000 of medical injuries, turns around and sues her own five-year-old nephew for battery. I'm gonna tell you that one more time in case you were not listening. Brian is five years old. He saw his aunt about to sit down in a chair. Just before he sat, he pulled it out, she fell, broke her hip, had $11,000 of medical injuries, turned around and sued her own five-year-old nephew for battery. A battery happens when you make intentional contact that is harmful and causes damages. So, in your gut, presuming Brian could pay, is Brian liable for battery, yes or no? Quick gut reaction. Yes or no? And what's so interesting about this is, as I've gone across the country, 95% of the time, 95% of the audience is saying, no, 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 no. We always got your random heartless educators. I see y'all out there, they're like, yes, hold that kid accountable. But like, they're kind of an outlier. And I want to pause there for a second. And I wanna ask you all, especially if you said no, I want you to think about nothing else but the ant. You're actually the ant's attorney. The ant is actually paying you money to take on her case. She needs your help. What is the best evidence that you're gonna to use to prove that his act was intentional? And two caveats, you can't make anything up and you have to presume all the facts are true. And I'll tell you those facts one more time. Brian is five years old, he saw his aunt about to sit in the chair and just before he sat, he pulled it out, she fell and broke her hip. She sued him for battery. I need you to give me the best evidence that suggests that this was done intentionally. I can't look in his head and prove it. So how do you use the evidence to do it? So now I'm forcing you to step away from that initial bias. I'm forcing you to think about this other side that seems incomprehensible, but now I want you to do it. Look at the evidence. Well, what do we know? We know that Brian saw her about to sit. So he saw her about to sit. We know he actually pulled out the chair, but he didn't just pull out the chair, did he? Didn't just pull out the chair. He pulled it out in an interesting way in an interesting manner and at an interesting time. He pulled it out, not five minutes before, not even five seconds before, but at the exact moment she was gonna sit. So I might go to court and it will sound something like this, Brian, uh, your honor, Brian might be five years old, but this particular five-year-old not only saw his hand about to sit, not only pulled out the chair, but he pulled it out at the precise moment that he knew pulling it would make it so that she would definitely fall. So that took timing, thoughtfulness, planning, intent. Now, I know some of y'all been dying to defend Brian. Second I started this case, you're like, mm, I don't like any of it. Don't talk about Brian. All right. What do you think is the most common defense that a fifth grader or an eighth grader would give you if they were defending Brian? Y'all already know it's going to be some version of he is five. He is five, exclamation point, underline my work here is done. And why are they saying he is five? Maybe five-year-olds don't understand the consequences of their actions. Sure, sure. I would presume that most five-year-olds don't want to purposely hospitalize their relatives. Most five-year-olds. Some of them are children, but most. But I can't just go on the court and say it was a joke. I need a better argument. And it's where it gets really interesting, okay? It gets really interesting because when I do this sort of work, I get feedback from teachers that say, Colin, it's really weird. My straight A high flyers struggle with this sort of thing. 
They struggle. They're so used to black and white. They're so used to an exact answer. They're so used to memorizing an algorithm that thinking on their toes doesn't really work as well. They're also surprised because they're struggling learners. The kids who, despite their best effort, have a hard time academically. You know these kids that study, 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 but still have a tough time? They do really well on this. Why is that? Well, they're used to translating things into several different variations until it makes sense to them. They're also used to the idea of learning how to learn. Who would have thunk it? In a century, at a time when learning how to learn is a 21st century asset, I struggling learners have a leg up. And you know who their rock stars are? Teachers say, Colin, you know who my rock stars are with this sort of instruction? My behavior kids. My behavior kids are the rock stars. And I can relate to that. I was never student of the week. My whole K-12 experience, mostly because of my behavior. Couldn't help it. I was just an obnoxious kid, never got student of the week. But I graduated top of my law school class. Why? Because it turned out that a lifetime of telling teachers, well, what had happened was, actually becomes a benefit in real life actually becomes a benefit when you be an asset think like this in law school. For instance, I once heard a behavior kid argue that like, hey, you know what Brian's best argument is? He was actually trying to be a gentleman. Think about it. What happened was he saw his aunt about to sit. So of course she goes to pull out the chair. Of course he pulls it out at the same moment she's gonna sit. But why does he pull it out too far? Because he's five. Because he's five. Five-year-olds don't have the best hand-eye coordination, fine motor skills, depth perception. I don't know if I believe that, but if it was an accident, by definition, it can't be on purpose. So we start looking at this. We start recognizing that there's so much in this really simple case. I could even start thinking about, well, why y'all look so weird when I brought up this case? Why does it seem so funky? Well, in what world does a five-year-old get sued by his own aunt? That's craziness. Makes no sense. Well, what's really going on? Tell me the backstory. What's going on behind the scenes? Well, maybe there's family drama. Maybe he's done this 55 times before and it's time to hold him accountable. Maybe she really needs some money. And you know what? I don't even care. I don't even care. What I do care about is what typically happens when we ask our kids a question and the answer is not right in front of them. What's the number one answer you get? Buh. Buh. Or the blank stare. I'm just going to sit here and stare at you. You're going to stare right back at me, and at some point, you're going to realize, I am not answering your question, Ms. Lipschitz, but if we go into that sense of justice and fairness, it's like they go to the edge of the earth for Brian. Now they're making all these predictions. Now they're thinking beyond the page, all these inferences. We could even have these big picture public policy evaluations. What would the world look like if you could just go around pulling out chairs on people, they get seriously hurt, but they can never recover because of the age of the person that did it to them. On the other hand, what would the world look like if you could sue five-year-olds every time they do a practical joke that goes wrong? Now the world is ideal, but which world would you actually prefer to live in? And at that point, we've taken something that's so conceptually simple, you could introduce it in elementary school. And we've literally brought it up to a level of rigor that you see in courtrooms across the country. And here's the thing. Maybe you change your mind about this. Maybe you look at this and you're like, I, okay, I, I think Brian should be liable. Maybe you still think Brian shouldn't be liable. Maybe you look at it and you say, you know what? I don't think Brian should be liable, but I think a judge would find Brian liable. And it seems to be somewhat of a disconnect. Like, ah, I'm not really sure. But in the spirit of doing right being more important than being right, in the actual case, the judge did find Brian liable. The judge had his own reasoning, but I want to talk to you about this. Because if you look at this and you say, you know what, this decision is trash. Great, because this is not a right answer. This is merely a judge's opinion. A judge wants to have the opinion that separate but equal was okay. We didn't have to accept that. Judges have opinions every single day that we don't have to accept. We can challenge it. And I want to talk to you about this, okay? There's something about this framework that I think just makes a really big difference. It's one thing to sit around and teach our kids what they need to analyze the world the way it is. It is what it is, right? That's part of the game. But it's another form of educational entirely to get our kids to ask questions to themselves and articulate by themselves what the world ought to be. You've heard that phrase before, you can lead a horse to water, but can't make him drink. 
This is how you start to make that horse ridiculously thirsty. Now this framework isn't just about a legal case, okay? This idea of making a claim, finding a way to back up that claim with evidence, thinking about different perspectives, weighing consequences, like what would the world look like if, and then having a conclusion drawn from that, it's a different way of analysis around how to argue, think, and write across disciplines. So in Think Law, we call this draw plus C. And if you text the word think to 66866, you'll get an example uh, that has this handout included in it. But if you look at this answer, I want to draw your attention just to this W. This is a third grade response, that W. If the ant wins her case, other kids will start getting sued. Kids don't have money or lawyers, so they're going beyond the page because we'll give them the structure to do that. Well, where does this apply beyond these legal cases? Anywhere. Anywhere, because we're deciding that engagement and learning are not the same thing. We're not getting kids engaged for the sake of engagement. We're getting kids engaged because we know what happens when they're intrinsically motivated. We know what happens when they're able to work autonomously, when they're able to find a way to connect with distance learning. You know how cool it is that our kids have a learning relationship in the academic space, K-12? Because they have a learning relationship offline. They have a learning relationship when they're on the streets, when they're with their people. But if they can do it in school, if you can have kids working where some kids are in person, some kids are virtual, and they're having this learning relationship around issues they really care about, and how do we get to that point? Well, active citizenship. Active citizenship. How is what I'm learning today connecting to my actual world? Well, let's talk about how we can do this and make those connections. Work hard, be nice. Isn't going to be enough. If I can get my kids to think, they're working and they're thinking, they're thinking critically. If I have kindergartners looking at poetry, maybe I'm not gonna settle for just having them identify what kind of poem is this? A limerick, a haiku, or free verse. I can go deeper. Poem, I love my friend, he went away from me. There's nothing more to say. The poem ends soft as it began. I love my friend. A very deep poem deserves a deep analysis. Kindergartners can look at this poem as part of a Socratic circle and have a big question. Is this a happy poem or a sad poem? State your evidence either way. Gets a pretty heated debate because there's a lot of good evidence for happy. You got love, you know, love for my friend. So much I had to say it twice. Uh, uh, soft is, is pretty happy. You know, teddy bears are soft, pillows are soft, mommy's hugs are soft. We start looking even deeper. There's nothing more to say. That could go either way. But one boy said, hey, you know what? I love my mom. There's nothing more to say, right? That's it. So sometimes you just feel so good. You don't have to say anything, all right? What about sad? Well, turns out love was in the past tense. He went away from me, it's pretty sad. Maybe something ending could be sad. Maybe there's nothing more to say can also go sad as well. Maybe the idea of being so devastated that you decided to title your poem, poem means you were in a crisis moment of depression kind of sad. And we start realizing there's so much to this, especially because I could flip it for secondary. It turns out Langston Hughes, a lot of historians think that Langston Hughes might have been in the closet during the Harlem Renaissance era. Hmm, is this a friend or a friend? Then again, one of his most famous poems, Mother to Son, is written from his mom's perspective. Is this poem even from his perspective? Maybe I can look at the literary techniques being used and argue one way or the other. I can go deeper. You say, oh, I see this from math for English. I see this for ELA. What about math or science? Well, let's get there. How do I make the same structure where I'm making a claim and backing up with evidence in a different subject? Well, what about math? I can look at you and say, all right, solve an equation. Or I can say, oh, Colin did this equation wrong. Explain his mistake. Or I can go one level higher. Colin did it wrong and Nick did it wrong. Which one is more right? And imagine that. Imagine this one group has to represent the left-hand side. The other group has to represent the right-hand side. And think about this. They're both wrong. Which one is more right? Two science experiments. Both have a flawed procedure. Which one is more likely to lead to accurate results? Two paragraphs. Both have structures that are not all that great. Which one is more likely to lead to a, 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 a better to understand a comprehend set of reading? Mistake analysis brings me to the higher level. I could even apply this to test prep. Because if you look at test prep better at a high level, it's not just about understanding why answers are right. It's also understanding why the other ones are wrong. And this one, they're talking about, oh, it's difficult to imagine a world today without grocery checkout counters lined with colorful packages of mint or fruit flavored gum. 
This is here because they're trying to say gum is a common and popular product. But look at that choice, choice I. There are more flavors in gum than there used to be. How are they getting Joe Schmo to pick that? Well, they got colorful packages, mint and fruit. That's basically like bullying this dude for no reason. So if our kids gonna have that higher level consciousness to catch those mistakes and look at a problem like this in advance and say, mm, what are all the different ways to get this one wrong? Think about the different level that they're at as they engage. And I look at this and say, you know what? I don't want my kids just to play the game when it comes to the test. I want them to slay the game altogether. I want my kids to be at the mastery level. Because if I could take kids that were born in a society that literally decided that mathematically they would be three-fifths of a person and get them to reach the mastery level on these assessments, to me, that is an, its own form of reparations right there in and of itself. And if we start adding this idea and this construct, they think about closing a critical gap before it even starts, closing a critical thinking gap before it even starts. If you want to ask why I say that critical thinking is the pathway to racial justice, I want to challenge you on something. We've all probably heard about three blind mice, but how often have you ever been asked the question, what are the hardships of being a blind mouse? Tell me about the struggle. Tell me about how it feels to be a blind mouse. Well, well, well you're more susceptible to prey. It, it's harder for you to get food compared to other mites with working eyes. You know, they've got that sight privilege. You start thinking about this, you start realizing, well, why do you think the blind mice were actually running after the farmer's wife? Well, huh, was it just to scare her? I mean, maybe she smelled like food. Maybe it's not about you, lady. You start thinking about her struggle. But what's hard about being a farmer's wife? I don't know, I'm from Brooklyn, but I can make some assumptions. I can make an assumption that she's waking up really early in the morning. I don't know, maybe she's married to some no good farmer. Maybe there's a lot of churning she's got to do when it gets in her back pain. I don't know. Why did she cut up their tails? I don't know, but I can start to think about their problems. And if I could think about their problems and empathize and figure out a way that they can piece it back together, that kind of different perspectives allows me to do the same thing in my content. Any single war I can look at and wonder, can they have come to a treaty earlier? Anytime I look at something like, oh, let me have my kids memorize that the earth is round and why? What if instead I haven't debate a flat earther? What if even when I use books that are not culturally responsive, like of mice and men, I could get my kids to think about an alternative ending that might be able to resolve their conflicts, those underlying issues in a way that allows me to apply a similar conflict resolution framework into my own life. So I want to kind of close with this idea. Okay, you want to talk about like culturally responsive teaching. I want to give you an example. I'm a math teacher. And as a math teacher, I love teaching poetry. I just think poetry is great for abstract thinking. And poetry also is also very motivating. One of my favorite poems ever is Robert Frost, Stop My Woods on a Snowy Evening. Now, I don't know that Robert Frost, Stop My Woods on a Snowy Evening is about some white dude, but I kind of presume that it is. So here's the thing. At this point, I'm teaching math in Las Vegas at a school that's 99% African-American. And it's kind of interesting to have a poem about some white dude in the forest filling up with snow at a school in the middle of the desert, teaching almost entirely African-American kids. So I thought about a different construct, which is like an investigation, but it's like Pulp Fictionizing content. I'm gonna take it out of order. For those of you that have seen the movie Pulp Fiction, it's out of order, it's in these different stories so we kind of break it up. So what I decided to do is break it up. I went to the last three lines of the poem and I asked my kids to look at this last three lines, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. And I asked him this question. Where is this person at, and have you been there? And all of a sudden, my kids were like, yeah, 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 I know exactly what's going on here. This guy is about to quit, and, and I've been there. But, but he's got promises. He, 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 can't, he can't quit, but he really, really wants to. Like, it's like when I turned my ankle during basketball tryouts, but I really, really wanted to make the team, so I had to keep on pushing, even though it was hurting. It's like, you know, I'm going to be the first person in my family to graduate, but I'm really credit deficient. But I've got promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and then making these connections, right? And now when they start looking at this poem, the lines hit a little bit different. Whose woods these are, I think I know. I know that it's not really even safe for me here. I know what it's like to be questioning the darkest evening of the year. They know what that is. They know what that is. I had a kid at that point whose dad had just been deported. She was in my pre-calculus class. She was college bound. And she's like, I don't know what to do because I feel like I've got promises to keep. 
and miles to go before I sleep. But this has been the darkest evening of the year. This line right here, the woods are lovely, dark and deep. Nobody would blame me if I quit right now. It's so tempting. So what do I do with it? And what I want to end with this for is I want to make it clear. When I talk about culturally responsive teaching, it's so much more than throwing the name Jose in a math problem. We need to make sure that we're centering our kids' values, their assets, their identity, their stories, and making the stories a part of accelerating the learning. That's the whole point of why we have this model. So as we talk about thinking like a lawyer, I want you to think about one technique you can see yourself applying right away. We talked about different perspectives. We talked about Pulp Fictionizing content, mistake analysis, really understanding that there's so much you can do when it comes to critical thinking, including this wait time. Wait time, just giving our kids the space to think about it. I always like to close this by saying, I grew up as a critical thinker in a black barbershop at the Flappish YMCA because argumentation, citing your evidence, being able to use pathos and logos and logos and ethos, all those different argumentation techniques came out of me growing up in my community. Watching my mom make a dollar out of 15 cents made me a critical thinker. So this critical thinker sitting in your school buildings right now. If you want to follow the educational equity equation, that means you need to commit yourself to unleashing that. So with that, we're at the end. If you want to learn more about our work, you can visit us at thinklaw.us. You can text THINK to 66866 to get a sample lesson. And again, follow me on Twitter at Colin E. Seal. To go deeper as well, you can also check out the Thinking Like a Lawyer book. So Nick, I'll take any questions that you have at this time that e e either you want to pose or things that came up on, on, on the live or in the chat here. So. Awesome. No, Colin, I, I mean, I really appreciate your passion for this work and, and just your drive in it and, and just how you, you, you wrap it all together. Uh, I think it's all deeply rooted in, in systematic structures that we've been working against. And I think you do a great job of, of really laying it out and, and making those, those true connections for, you know, our leaders and, and for our, our folks, you know, supporting the, the young people around our communities. Uh, one of the questions that uh, I, I think came up was, was really around, you know, what does this mean for our priority students, right? So, so specifically those students in, in, in today's age, right, this COVID environment, um, you know, specifically those, those EL and DL students that, that typically need these specialized services. Um, uh, what have you seen as, as far as the approach or what would you suggest as far as that approach to ensure that, you know, those students' gaps aren't in, uh, continuing to increase? Yeah, so it always starts like this. I can ask you a question, well, why is it hard for educators to teach critical thinking to English learners? But then I can ask you a different question. In what ways are English learners already critical thinkers? Then we gotta smack ourselves for a second because we recognize we've got a set of kids here who are thinking in two different languages, not just orally, but also looking at body language, having to move back and forth between different cultures. And we realize that's on us. That's on us, not them. It's about our expectation level, not theirs. So when I think about concrete strategies and I have a whole chapter in a book where I talk about this, Sometimes you recognize that at the very beginning, whether your kids are just never been exposed to this or not, or if they have other different um, things that just don't allow them to necessarily be automatic with how they get there, I might want to use more sentence frames. I might want to scaffold it to kind of make it so that they can work their way towards a much more thorough level of structure. Um, I might think about ways that argumentation can be formed in their native language. Right. I might want to think about the way argumentation can be formed using different visuals because the structures of argumentation don't really make a difference. Once they get the structure down, it becomes part of the pattern. So it starts by understanding that they can. Right. Part of the workshop that I'm doing tomorrow with Dr. Padilla is talking about this idea that these kids can't is the guarantee way to know that those kids won't. But if we can have a these kids can mentality and match that with a little bit of assistance that gradually gets released, right? These are more of like September, October sort of issues than they are March, April kinds of issues, then our kids will get to where we need to get to when it comes to critical thinking. Awesome. Well, you know, I, I think that's a, a perfect way to, to wrap us up today, Colin. Again, I, I really do appreciate you coming out today and sharing with our community uh, around, you know, kind of this, this very impactful work. So, you know, just wanted to, to close this out. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send into the chat function uh, just a, a quick survey link uh, for uh, today's session. Just uh, we're always looking for feedback on you know these sessions as well, as we want to be sure that we're always bringing that most relevant and and supportive content for you all. 
Um, just wanted to give a quick, you know, update on the upcoming sessions that we have over the next couple of weeks. Again, you can, you know, visit us uh, at InnovatorSIP.com uh, to see, you know, and sign up for these future sessions. Uh, and as I mentioned as well, um, uh, I, uh, I put the link into the chat just for a quick survey on any feedback or any question, follow up questions that you may have for Colin. We'll be sure to get those over to him ASAP. Uh, as he mentioned, he shared his, his social media channels and, and handles as well. Uh, so be sure to follow, you know, think Law US uh, on Facebook, you know, to ensure that, you know, you can continue to get his content. As you saw, just the great job he did today, really sharing with the community. We really appreciate you all. Uh, but as always, you know, we look forward to see you all in future sessions. I also invite you to, you know, download that, you know, back to school playbook that we released and a lot of our partners have been utilizing. And again, if you have any questions or would like to learn a little bit more about either ThinkLaw or Innovare, uh, feel free to use the link that has been dropped into the chat um, to find some time with us. But again, you know, that, that's it for today. We really appreciate you. Uh, Colin, we appreciate you for coming and, and joining us today for all of the folks on Zoom and all of the folks on the Facebook Live account. We hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.